All right, well, welcome, good evening, and God bless you. It is Wednesday evening, and we dig in the Word of God and study through the Scriptures line by line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and today we will be navigating through the book of 2 Kings chapter 10. But before we do that, we are going to give a summary overview of chapter 9 tonight. So as you join us, once again, welcome. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 10 and leave it there until I'm done opening in prayer and giving a summary overview of chapter 9, and then we'll navigate through the scriptures together. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, as always, for the privilege and opportunity of coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ to study and show ourselves approved. The Word of God is truth, it's life, it's wisdom. We receive instruction, we receive revelation in and through your word and by your spirit. So we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you as we're navigating through the Old Testament that we would learn eternal truths and principles in the Bible that we could apply to our lives even today. The word is that powerful, it's that active, and it's that alive. So Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, as we review 2 Kings chapter 9, we're seeing the nation of Israel in a state of rebellion against God, and we're seeing a continual succession of wicked leaders and kings. We're seeing God's prophets give revelation and, and forecasting what will take place in the future in regards to the kings and the nation of Israel. And, and we could almost equate this to after the Israelites were freed from captivity in Egypt. They wandered in the desert for 40 years because they were disobedient and they did not walk by faith. So we don't see the nation progressing. What we do see is that sin always leads to death. And we're hearing a lot about dying and we're going to hear a lot about dying in this chapter also, 10 tonight. Chapter 9 talked about a lot of deaths. Chapter 10 too. But there's always hope. And we see that God keeps his covenant blessings and promises with those he makes covenant relationships with. And we also see that God's faithful and we're not. <laughs> Everything points to Jesus. So all the lessons we learn in Old Testament teaching teach us our need for a Savior and our need for the Holy Spirit to indwell us and empower us to live lives worthy of the call that we've been given by God. So with that being said, I'm going to give a summary overview briefly of chapter 9 in verses 1 through 13 of 1 Kings chapter 9. Elisha sends a young prophet to anoint Jehu as king over Israel and instructs him to execute God's judgment against the house of Ahab. Jehu's fellow officers quickly pledge allegiance to him. So in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, God would speak through prophets. So we're seeing here a delegation of authority from the senior prophet, Elisha, to a minor prophet whose name is not even mentioned. But there's always chain of command and order in the scriptures, never chaos. In verses 14 through 26, Jehu kills Joram, the king of Israel, fulfilling the prophecy of Elijah regarding the downfall of Ahab's house. Ahaziah, the king of Judah, is also killed. So in this time period, God is anointing and using Jehu to execute judgment over his people and over the tribes of Israel and over a divided nation. That's what we're seeing here. In verses 27 to 29, Jehu orders the execution of Jezebel, Ahab's wife, fulfilling Elisha's prophecy concerning her gruesome demise. If you remember several chapters back, Elisha prophesied that Jezebel would fall, and he was detailed in how she would die, and that's exactly how she died. So Jezebel's body in verses 30 to 37 is trampled upon by horses in accordance with Elijah's prophecy. Jehu consolidates his power in Israel and eliminates all of Ahab's remaining descendants. When God executes judgment, it's final and complete. When God's timing comes, that's when God's judgment comes. His will, his way, and his time. So some thoughts and reflections from chapter 9. The swift and decisive actions of Jehu 
illustrate the fulfillment of God's judgment against the house of Ahab. When the Lord says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, he means it. The downfall of Jezebel serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of idolatry and wickedness. God will judge and there will be consequences. Elisha's role in the anointing of Jehu highlights the, the continuity of the prophetic authority and divine intervention in the affairs of kings and kingdoms. God is ultimately in control. We see God's sovereignty clearly throughout the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament and throughout God ordering things to be done at certain times. So, some takeaways. God's judgment is certain and often executed through appointed individuals, even when it involves the overthrow of rulers and the eradication of dynasties. God will do what he says he's going to do. The downfall of Ahab's house serves as a warning against the dangers of idolatry, disobedience, and corruption in leadership. These principles are still active and alive today. God's house needs to be in order. It needs to be unified. There needs to be chain of command. There needs to be respect for authority and submission to authority for anything to run well. The importance of heeding to the warnings of prophets and recognizing the consequences of sinful actions is underscored through the tragic fate of Ahab's family. So there are consequences that to the legacy of these people who were wicked and perverse in their leadership. So, in summary, chapter 9 provides a, a comprehensive overview hiding key events, highlighting key events, themes, and the significance within the broader narrative of the Bible. I mentioned Sunday about the meta-narrative, creation, the fall, redemption, reconciliation, all a part of God's plan. We're seeing the consequences of the fall played out through the nation of Israel, even though they were in covenant relationship with God because they chose to be disobedient and rebellious. They chose to disobey God, his laws, his statutes, and his commands. Obedience always precedes blessing. Disobedience brings a curse. Now, that applies to us, too. Even though we have a better covenant and we're blessed by God, the consequences of our decisions will either bring blessings or cursings upon us, depending on how we handle the word of God and submit to it. I say this a lot, and I mean it. When you're mature in Christ, you learn to live by the Spirit, and that supersedes your emotions and your feelings. You have to overcome emotions and feelings by faith, trusting God beyond what you think or feel. That's a part of growth and maturity. So when you're looking to recline or shrink, black, shrink back or turn back, that's where you have to stand in faith and move forward and fight forward. Paul said it this way in Philippians 3. He says, I choose to forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. We don't want to go backwards. We want to go forwards. And God will give you the strength in and through the Spirit to do that once you choose to walk by faith and not by sight. That's the truth. And the truth will set you free. So I say all that to lead into chapter 10, which is a lot of verses, but they're bunched in groups. So even though there's a decent amount of verses in this chapter, um, a lot of the content is, is bunched and the commentary. So what we're going to talk about in this chapter is a continuation of what we talked about last chapter. The reforms of Jehu. How God used this man to execute judgment and he's not done executing judgment. But just as he is given the authority to execute judgment, he himself will be judged for how he handles his authority and how he chooses either to walk in obedience or in disobedience to the Lord. So, yes, God is using him in a mighty way, but God will also judge him for his actions and his behaviors, as we will see when we navigate through this chapter. So, we're going to begin with a large portion of Scripture. And what we're starting out with in this chapter is Jehu executes the house of Ahab. He is not finished executing Ahab's house and family. Let's read it. Verses 1 through 11. Ahab's descendants are executed at Jezreel. Now Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. And Jehu wrote and sent letters to Samaria, to the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to those who reared 
Ahab's sons, saying, Now as soon as this letter comes to you, since your master's sons are with you, you and you have chariots and horses, a fortified city also, and weapons, choose the best qualified of your master's sons, set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid and said, Look, two kings could not stand up to him, then how can we stand? And he who was in charge of the house, and he who was in charge of the city, the elders also, and those who reared the sons, sent to Jehu, saying, We are your servants, we will do all you tell us, but we will not make anyone king. Do what is right in your sight. Then he wrote a second letter to them, saying, If you are for me and will obey my voice, take heeds to the men, your master's sons, and come to me at Jezreel by this time tomorrow. Now the king's sons, 70 persons, were with the great men of the city who were rearing them. So it was when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slaughtered 70 persons, put their heads in baskets, and sent them to him and Jezreel. Then a messenger came and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, Lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until morning. So it was in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, You are righteous indeed. I conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? Know now that nothing shall fall to the earth of the word of the Lord, which the Lord has spoke concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord has done what we have spoke by his servant Elijah. So Jehu killed all who remained of the house of Ahab and Jezreel and all his great men and close acquaintances and his priests until he left him none remaining. So Jehu's exercising his authority. And he sent those letters to say, who's with me, who's not with me, and if you are with me, do what I tell you to do. It's a part of the prophecy that Elisha gave. So, let's navigate through those verses. Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. These were a significant danger to the anointed King Jehu. First, they were the descendants of Ahab and had a great interest in battling back to keep the throne of Israel amongst the dynasty of Omri. Second, they were in Samaria, the capital city of Israel, meaning that they were away from Jehu, who killed Joram in Jezreel. So when he said, fight for your master's house, Jehu challenged any partisans of the house of Omri to declare themselves and prepare to fight for their master's house. When the letter came to them and they took the king's sons and slaughtered them, Jehu's letter and his previous bold action against Joram and Ahaziah powerfully persuaded the leaders of Israel to execute the sons of Ahab on Jehu's behalf. Jehu was a man of intense power and authority, and God was using him, and they saw that, so they feared him. They had a fear of Jehu. And he told them what they do. And this was customary in those days, that when you conquered a king or a nation, you would cut the heads off of the men and put them at the gate of the city. For what purpose? To show what takes place if you come against or rebel against the king. So that was something that was done customary. So this was a bold action of what Jehu asked them to do, but they knew that he killed Joram and Ahaziah, the two other kings. So... His letter powerfully persuaded the leaders of Israel to execute the sons of Ahab on behalf of Jehu. And again, I told you what the thing is to put their heads in a basket. This was customary, and it showed dominance and also the authority of the leader to put fear in the people, not to challenge his authority. And that God's anointing was on him as spoken by the prophet Elijah. He's not done yet with his executions. Let's continue in verses 12 through 14. <clears throat> and he arose and departed and went to Samaria. On the way at Beth Aked of the shepherds, 
Jehu met with the brothers of Ahaziah, the king of Judah, and said, Who are you? So they answered, We are the brothers of Ahaziah. We have come down to greet the sons of the king and the sons of the queen mother. I guess they didn't know that the sons of the king were just executed. And the queen mother is to be executed. And he said, take them alive. So they took them alive and killed them at the well of Beth Aked, 42 men, and he left none of them. So this was a great misfortune to these men since Jehu was committed to execute all those connected to the house of Ahab. These men were also targets of his judgment. Ahaziah was a descendant of King Ahab through his mother, who was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Therefore, their mention of the queen mother did not help them. It basically forged their execution. And as was the characteristic of Jehu, he was in wholehearted and energetic obedience to God and left none of them alive. So, some commentary suggests that a, a Jehu's execution of Ahaziah's family was going too far. Some commentaries suggest that. But in his mind, he had a mission to carry out, and he was going to complete it. Let's continue. Verses 15 to 17. The killing does not end here. Now when he departed from there, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him and said to him, is your heart right as my heart is towards your heart? And Jehonadab answered, it is. Jehu said, if it is, give me your hand. So he gave him his hand and he took him up into his chariot. Then he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they had him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he killed all who remained to Ahab in Samaria till he had destroyed them according to the word of the Lord which he spoke to Elijah. So what's the significance of Jehonadab? We're going to see that. This man was the mysterious founder of the Rechabites. Who were the Rechabites? They were a reform movement among the people of God protesting the immoral and impure lives of many in Israel and Judah. In Jeremiah chapter 35, God used the Rechabites and the memory of Jehonadab as an example of faithfulness and obedience to rebuke his unfaithful and disobedient people. Jeremiah records that Jehonadab was a leader of an aesthetic group that lived in austere, nomadic life in the desert, drinking no wine and depending solely on the Lord for their sustenance. Separatists to the core and strong patriots, they lived in protest to the materialism and religious compromise of Israel. So these were people set apart, holy and set apart for God. According to the historian Josephus, Jehu and Jehonadab, Jehonadab were friends of long standing and both detested the luxurious surrounding of the royal family. So they were on the same page in their thinking. And he asked them a question. Is your heart right as my heart is towards you? In other words, are we on the same page? Jehu wanted to know if Jehonadab was on his side. Jehonadab was optimistic at the emergence of this energetic reformer. Jehu was hungry for the approval of this popular religious leader and reformer. It is not too cynical to think that Jehu wanted to use Jehonadab to add legitimacy to his reign as king. So he wanted that alliance. That's a good alliance to have. Jehonadab was doubtless a very honorable man in Israel. And by carrying him about with him in his chariot, Jehu endeavored to acquire the public esteem. Jehu must be acting right, for Jehonadab is with him and approves his conduct. So he had a reason for wanting allegiance with this man. And then he made a statement which will come back to bite him later on. He said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Sometimes zeal without wisdom is dangerous. Sometimes if we have too much zeal, pride can be involved with that. 
So the zeal of Jehu was noted in his complete and energetic obedience to the Lord to disregard of his own safety and comfort. Yet this statement reveals the dangerous root of pride in Jehu. He is proud of his own zeal. That will be a problem in his future, as we will see as we continue to study about his life. When proceeding against Baal worship, his words to Jehonadab, come with me and see my zeal for Jehovah, are in themselves a revelation of a proud spirit. This ostentatious display of his reforming zeal revealed how little he had God's glory in the mind in the midst of all of his feverish activity and abolition. He was focused on accomplishing not just what was prophesied, but he wanted to do it for himself. He had a, a mission. And he was very strong in his mission, as we are seeing and will continue to see, because he's not done killing people. And in this section, he's going after the bow worshipers. So let's read it together. Verses 18 to 23. Then Jehu gathered all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little. Jehu will serve him much. Now therefore, call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests. Let no one be missing, for I have a great sacrifice for Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu acted deceptively with the intent of destroying the worshipers of Baal. And Jehu said, proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. So they proclaimed it. Then Jehu sent throughout all Israel and all the worshipers of Baal came, and so that there was not one man left who did not come. So they came to the temple of Baal, and the temple of Baal was full from one end to the other. And he said to the one in charge of the wardrobe, bring out the vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. He went full steam with this. He wanted to make sure that this deception was strong. And he gets the vestments. They had vestments they wore. Then Jehu and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, went into the temple of Baal and said to the worshipers of Baal, search and see that no servants of the Lord are here with you, but only worshipers of Baal. This was a setup. This was a holy setup to blot out idol worship. So, Ahab served Baal a little. Jehu will serve him much. Jehu feigned devotion to Baal to lure the priests and worshipers of Baal into a trap. He acted decept deceptively with the intent of killing all of them. I have a great sacrifice, he said. We're going to do something that never has been done before, and that was true. The priests of Baal believed in the deception. They were excited about their new king, Jehu, and the famous sheik of the Rechabites, Jehonadab, were now distinguished converts and were joining in them in the ceremonial sacrifice to Baal, so they thought. And then to top it off, he wanted no believers of the one true God in that place. He said, search and see that no servants of the Lord are here with you, but only worshipers of Baal. So Jehu wanted to be certain that all the worshipers of the true God were put out of that place. He knew what to do. See, the Bible shows us how God knows how to choose people for certain assignments. He knows their character. He knows their abilities. He knows what they're willing to do to accomplish what the assignment is. Jehu was the man for this job. No doubt about it. Let's continue. Verses 24 through 28. So they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had appointed for himself 80 men on the outside. And it said, if any of the men whom I brought into your hands escapes, whoever lets him escape, it shall be his life for the life of the other. Now it happened, as soon as he had made an offering, made an end of offering, the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, now go in and kill them. Let no one come out. Here's the mass execution. And they killed them with the edge of the sword. Then the guards and the officers threw them out and went into the inner, inner room of the temple of Baal. And they brought the sacred pillars out of the temple of Baal and burned them. 
Then they broke down the sacred pillar of Baal and tore down the temple of Baal and made it a refuge dump till this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. So, so far as we're looking at this man Jehu, he's intense, he's doing everything that is required of him, but we caught a glimpse of pride in him not too long ago. Let's see what happens as we continue to navigate. Remember, Ahab built the temple of Baal for his wife Jezebel back in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 32. Jehu tore it down. He worked completely to eliminate the worship of Baal from Israel, making him a unique king among the rulers of the northern kingdom. Because if we look back, beginning with the first king of Israel, Jeroboam, Israel was steeped in idolatry. Jeroboam began with the false representations of the true God, the golden calves, described in 1 Kings chapter 12. The successive kings of Israel continued his idolatry. Who were they? Nadab, Basha, Elah, Zimri, and Omri, until the reign of Ahab. Under King Ahab, Israel moved from the false worship of the true God to the state-supported worship of Baal. And we saw that in 1 Kings 16, verses 29 to 34. The son of Ahab, Jehoram, who was also called Joram, continued this practice until he was assassinated by Jehu, who destroyed the infrastructure of the state-sponsored Baal worship in Israel. Remember, that's why Ahab was more wicked than the other kings. Not only did he worship and allow the worship of idols and false gods, he made it a state-sanctioned thing that you have to worship Baal. He was wicked, and God's judgment is coming upon his house and his family. And God used Jehu, but Jehu was the man who God knew would execute this judgment. Remember, Elisha had a problem with Ahab and Jezebel. And he got scared. And he ran and hid and wanted to take his own life, Elijah. And what happened? An angel nourished him there and and ministered to him there. And God said, I'm giving you a new assignment. But God never forgot what Ahab and Jezebel did to Elijah and also to the nation of Israel. And vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And at the right time, God raised up the right man who would execute the judgment and take care of Ahab and Jezebel and their whole family line. We're seeing that happen right now in this chapter. And God is using Jehu to do that. So, Here's where we see a twist. Verses 29 to 31, and we're going to preface it this way, the halfway obedience of Jehu. So far, he's done everything he was asked to do, but now we're going to see a shift. Let's look at verse 29 to 31. However, Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin, that is, from the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight and have done to the house of Ahab all that was in my heart, your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Now, once again, God is blessing his from his obedience, but it's a partial blessing. It says only to the fourth generation. Why? In God's sovereignty, God knows what's coming. But listen to this. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the Lord, the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin. Partial obedience, not total obedience. The Bible says you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God doesn't want partial obedience. He wants complete obedience. I've seen a lot of Christians in my experience as a pastor over the years come into the kingdom, partake of the kingdom, but when they were challenged to go deeper and truly surrender their lives to God completely, that's where they drew the line. And they would not fully submit. And that's where we get the term carnal Christians or Christians who do not walk in the full obedience of the call. It happened back then. 
it still happens now. That's why the scripture is very applicable to us. That's why we have to search our own hearts when we read and reflect upon the word and allow the word and the spirit to discern our hearts, which can make us get right with God when we need to get right. The word discerns things in us that we don't even see and know through the power of the scripture. And then we're brought to the valley of decision. Jehu chose not to heed and walk in the ways of the Lord. Disobedience always brings judgment, correction, and if not, repentance, death. We know that. These principles still apply. So, when it said, however, Jehu did not, did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, what does that mean? Jehu aggressively worked against the worship of Baal. However, he promoted the false worship of the true God after the pattern of Jeroboam who set up golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. He did not address that. The commentary says, do not be content to be strong against evil, but eagerly ambitious of good. It is easier to be vehement against the abomination of others than to judge and put away your own secret sins. That is so true. Jehu did obey God up to a certain point. It happened to be a profitable thing to him to exterminate the old royal house of Ahab because it would confirm himself upon his own throne. But anything beyond that he did not pay, and therefore Jehu did not touch it. He was self-interested. But God rewarded him for his obedience because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight. So God would reward him and his family for four generations. <clears throat> this was clear praise of Jehu's actions. Yet, in the book of Hosea, chapter 1, verse 4, condemns his actions. For in a little while, I will average the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. We can see that both here in 2 Kings 10 and also in Hosea 1, 4 are true in that Jehu was both good and bad. He was obedient and then he was disobedient. Jehu carried out God's will, but he went too far and executed more people than God intended. One thing. Jehu carried out God's will, but he did it for personal glory and out of pride. Another thing. Jehu carried out God's will, but he only did it partially. He stopped the idolatry of Baal, but he continued in the sinful idolatry of Jeroboam. He took no heed to walk in the law of the God of Israel with all his heart. Yet Jehu was also clearly disobedient and did not obey or serve God with all of his heart. We can learn from that. We see that pattern through several of the kings in the nation of Israel. Charles Spurgeon says this, Hating one sin, he loved another, and thus proved that the fear of the Most High did not reign in his breast. He was merely a hired servant and received the throne as his wages, but a child of God he never was. God will search the motives and intents of our heart. God knows the motives and intents of our hearts. We know that, and we see that here. So verses 32 to 33, we hear a summary of Jehu's reign. In those days, the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. And Haziel conquered them in all the territory of Israel from the Jordan eastward. All the land of Gilead, Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, from Aurora, which is by the river Arnon, including Gilead and Bashan. So, in those days, the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. This was God's doing. This was the work of the Lord. These neighboring rulers and their kingdoms were prompted and made successful by God. By judging his people for their disobedience, he allowed these things to happen to his nation. All the territory of Israel from the Jordan eastward. For hundreds of years before this, since the time of the entry into the promised land, 
more than 600 years before, Israel held substantial portions of land on the eastern side of the Jordan River. If you remember, two and a half tribes wanted to remain on the east side, and God allowed them. Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, half of Manasseh. Now this land was taken by the enemies of Israel because of their sin and unfaithfulness to the covenant. This included the rich and fruitful lands of Gilead and Bashan. So as we continue and come to the conclusion of the chapter, by going over the summary of the reign of Jehu, now the rest of the acts of Jehu and all that he did and all his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Jehu rescued, rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. Then Jehoahaz, his son, reigned in his place, and the period that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. So he had a long reign. God did bless him for his partial obedience. But his blessing ended because of his disobedience through his family line. So they buried him in Samaria. Though incomplete in his own goodness, this man was the best of a bad group. Jehu's goodness was rewarded with a long reign, 28 years. This was a long reign, but notable only at its beginning. Jehu had the energy and influence to truly turn the nation of Israel back to God. But his half-hearted commitment to God left that potential unfulfilled and points to a lack of any real relationship with God. He fell short of God's best. He had an opportunity to accomplish it, but his heart was not right with God and he fell short. He took what was given to him as a blessing from God, and that was enough. That's all he wanted. His interests were not really God's interests, and his heart was not really after God's heart. That's revealed by his actions. What does Scripture tell us, right? In the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Faith without works is dead. We know that also. So, we have no chronicles in which there is anything further spoken about this man. His reign was long, 28 years, and yet we know nothing of it but the commencement. The great lesson to be drawn from this remarkable man's life is that of being constantly on guard as servants of God, lest we be found doing his work, whether it be an exercise of discipline or in the accomplishment of reformation, in a spirit of unbrokenness and without due exercise of heart and conscience between him who is a God of judgment and by whom actions are weighed. This is why the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The only one who can truly alter our future is God. And when we're in covenant relationship with God as New Testament believers, we have been given covenant promises. And in with those promises, as we choose to live by faith and walk by faith, and walk in obedience to God's word and the leading of the Holy Spirit, we are covered, protected, and provided for by God. That's the promise. We have a greater covenant, a greater promise, because the Spirit lives in us. The Spirit just doesn't come upon prophets and kings like in the old covenant, where certain people, for certain reasons and times, we are indwelt with the presence of God, the Holy Spirit who is God. We have to understand that reality and when we feed our spirit through faith, through the word, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, we become stronger in our identity and in our purpose, and we have more passion, and the focus is on the destiny that God has for us. We're not trying to figure out our own lives or become our own persons. No, we surrender our life, and we live for God. We come off the throne, he goes on the throne, and the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Christ orders our steps. But you must seek him with all your heart to find him in every season of your life. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have obstacles. You're going to be tested. James says it clearly in James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy in trials of tribulations of all kinds because these things are producing something, endurance and perseverance, where you're not going back to the person you used to be. You're not shrinking back, but you're straining toward what is ahead, which is the prize heavenly, 
heavenwardly in Christ Jesus. We don't look back. We don't stay stuck. We move forward by faith. And we walk by faith and not by sight. You have to learn to put your flesh to death. You got to kill it, not coddle it. Meaning, that's the straining part. That's the part where you got to get out of your comfort zone. God's not going to make you comfortable. He's going to do the exact opposite. He's going to challenge you to die to yourself in every area of your life. So you could be more effective for him and his kingdom. To much is given, much is required. When you're faithful in the little things, God will bless you with more. You're not a victim, you're a victor in Christ. Whenever you wallow in self-pity, you're a victim. Whenever you move forward by faith, you're a victor. And that's what we're called to do. And it's a painful process. It's called the slow burn. And we're all in it. We're being sanctified and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit as we walk in willful submission to God's words and God's ways. We learn in Scripture that when people were in doubt or blessed by God in covenant relationship, when they walked in obedience to that, they were continually blessed. But when they chose to disobey, that's when judgment and cursings came upon them. And not just them and their families. We were all born in sin. We all have generational ties and, and attachments to us that are sinful through our family lines. Jesus came to conquer sin and death, to cut those ties. And he does that as we submit our lives to him and walk by faith and not by sight. As we truly surrender the weaknesses of our character, of our personality, of our soul, which is sinful, and submit it to God, then we have the victory through the Spirit. See, Paul figured that out in Romans 7 and 8. Why do I do the things I don't want to do when I know the things that I should do? It's not me, but sin in me. He understood what a wretch he was in his sinful condition. Woe is me, a wretch. But then in chapter 8, he realizes through the Spirit that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That we're new creatures in Christ. All things pass away and all things become new. We are more than conquerors in Christ. No weapon formed against us shall prosper, meaning weapons may form, but they will not prosper. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Understanding the Spirit of God has the resurrection power of Christ to break those ties, those generational curses, to give us the power to overcome our feelings and emotions and not shrink back and isolate, but move forward in faith. You have to learn to fight the good fight of faith. Nobody's going to do that for you. You have to choose to do that yourself. God gives you the tools. He gives you the word. He gives you the spirit. He gives you the desire. Because when you're in the spirit, you desire the things of God. That's why the only way to deal with the flesh is to put it to death. Because it will be at enmity with God and always try to take control. Your flesh wants to lead. You have to learn to kill it daily. You have to learn to die to self daily. That's the process. And we do that through the washing of the word. And then through the submission to the kingdom and walking by faith in obedience. So I want to go over some, give an overview of the chapter first. I want to be very thorough. And then I want to give some thoughts and reflections on the chapter and some takeaways before I open it up for comments thoughts, or questions. In the first 17 verses, Jehu eliminates the remaining descendants of Ahab in Jezreel and Samaria, fulfilling God's command to eradicate Ahab's house. Jehu also kills the supporters and priests of Baal, effectively eradicating Baal worship from Israel. He was perfectly obedient in the beginning. In verses 18 through 28, Jehu deceives the worshipers of Baal into gathering into a temple where he orders their massacre, completely destroying the worship of Baal in Israel. He accomplished what he wanted to do, what God told him to do. Verses 29 through 31, Jehu was zealous in destroying the worship of Baal. He did not follow with God with all of his heart and continued in the sins of Jeroboam. That was the switch. That's where he went, goes from full obedience to disobedience. 
verses 30 through to 36, Jehu's reign over Israel is marked by military campaigns and conflicts with neighboring kingdoms, fulfilling the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah. Elijah prophesied this before it happened. So what are some thoughts and reflections on this chapter? Jehu's zeal in executing God's judgment against the worship of Baal demonstrates his commitment to fulfilling God's commands. The eradication of Baal worship from Israel highlights the importance of true worship and the consequences of idolatry and sin, which always lead to death. Jehu's incomplete obedience to God's commands serves as a reminder of the complexity of the human nature and the need for wholehearted devotion to God. We have to seek God with all of our heart, not part of our hearts, all of it. That's the requirement. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your hearts. The word and the spirit will expose and examine our hearts. And the seeking is done when we are willing to release those things of the flesh which bring contamination and mixture into our lives and submit to the will of God. And that root, those roots are constantly being cut through the word and by the spirit. We are a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. All things become new in Christ. When we're in the word and in the spirit, we're in Christ. So what's takeaways? God's judgment against idolatry is a severe, is severe and decisive. But it also is tempered with mercy for those who repent. So many Christians allow mixture and contamination in their walk. It will affect your worship to God. It will affect your personal well-being. The Bible says very clearly the joy of the Lord is our strength. You're not going to have joy when you're walking in partial obedience. You're not going to have joy when there's mixture and contamination in your life. You're not going to have joy. The Word and the Spirit will deal with those issues of our heart and reveal them so we can repent and have joy. We just have to be obedient and do it. We can stay on a hamster wheel or wander in a desert like Israel did for 40 years because of their disobedience and say, woe is me, I'm a victim. And look back instead of looking forward but that's not what God's called us to do and who he's called us to be. He's called us to be worshipers of him in spirit and in truth. That's what we're called to be. So there's good takeaways there for us. There's good life lessons here. There's principles that we see that will either affect blessing in our life or curses upon our life based on our decisions. God always gives us the freedom to choose. He never takes away choice. You're going to get as much of God as you want, as much of Jesus as you want, and that you're willing to surrender to. It's not just knowing the information that's given in the Bible. It's submitting to it by living it out. That's the evidence. Jesus said, you will know my followers, you will know my disciples by their fruit. Well, we're seeing the nation of Israel in a disobedient and rebellious place in these books that we're studying right now because they would not submit. They would partially submit, but they would not fully submit. And judgment and recompense always came upon them until they came to a place of repentance. With repentance comes renewal and restoration. We should learn from our faith and from the Bible how we should proceed forward and not fall into these traps. The Bible's given us wisdom not to fall into these traps. When you're cleaning out your heart and you're allowing the word and the spirit to clean out your heart, you got to let them clean it out completely. As you're studying and reading and you're reflecting and praying, you should be asking the Holy Spirit to show you any areas of your heart that are misaligned that are unsurrendered. Instead of wallowing in self-pity, ask God to reveal to you anything that needs to be addressed and confronted in your life. And then the Spirit will honor that prayer and lead you to truth about yourself and lead you to a place of repentance first and then restoration. And that's when the blessing comes. That's the process. 
It's a lot to learn from the Old Testament. It's important we study the whole counsel of God. So we can, we can chew on this, reflect upon it, and pray on it. And ask the Lord to reveal our heart. So we can see the truth about ourselves. And then we could submit and surrender and move forward in our faith. As Paul said, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. We are straining toward what's ahead. It's not easy. Life's not easy. Change isn't easy. You know, there's a cost of discipleship. That cost is you. And, you know, the process, the slow burn is just that, a slow burn. But it's necessary for us to be all that God has called us to be while we're on this earth. And he's preparing us for eternity. That's what he's doing. So praise God. Just a few more things I want to comment before I open it up regarding the chapter. And again, motives and intents. Why did Jehu deceive the worshipers of Baal into gathering in the temple? Jehu likely sought to eliminate all the traces of Baal worship in one swift and decisive action, ensuring that there would be no resurgence of idolatry in Israel. But the motivation was to extend his dynasty because he truly didn't eliminate all false worship. So his actions were partial and incomplete. He should have followed through and went after the, the false worship in Bethel and Dan. The false worship of the golden calf. He should have executed that judgment also, but he did not. And the Lord told him, if you walk in obedience, you will be blessed. So what are the consequences of Jehu's partial obedience to God's commands? Although Jehu eradicated the worship of Baal, he continued in the sins of Jeroboam and did not fully follow God wholeheartedly. This ultimately led to the continuation of idolatry and disobedience in Israel. So much is given, much is required. Because of his disobedience, the nation continued in sin. He had an opportunity to exercise his authority, authority in a way that would help cleanse the nation of sin, but he chose not to do it. He got enough of what he wanted for himself. That was enough. How does Jehu's reign fulfill the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah? Jehu's military campaigns, campaigns and conflicts with neighboring kingdoms fulfill the prophecy of the Lord concerning, concerning the destruction of Ahab's house and the establishment of Jehu as king over Israel. God knew his choices before he even made them. God knows our choices before we even make them. But that does not negate our free will. It just shows us the awesome sovereignty of God, his omniscience, omnipresence, all-knowing, all-seeing. God knows the beginning and from the end and everything in between. That's why we fear him. That's why we should be grateful for him calling us first and for us responding to the call of salvation, the gift of salvation, welcoming us into the family of God in covenant relationship through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. We should be grateful for that every day of our lives and see it that way. The gifts that we were given in Christ and the gifts we received through Christ and the fulfillment of life in and through Christ. So we see the narrative of the nation of Israel continue. Partial obedience, there's still sin and rebellion. Great chapter, a lot to chew on, a lot to learn from. At this time, I'm going to open it up for comments, thoughts, questions from anyone here. And if for those that are online with us, I'm going to make sure I can see it. If anyone puts any questions out, um, I will see them and share them with the group here, and we will be able to respond to them. So let me open it up. Any thoughts, comments, takeaways, questions regarding the study tonight for those that are here? Anybody? Give you a moment to chew on it and think about it. Joe.
Yeah, it was political and also selfish. They wanted to keep and covet. Right. You're right. And, and his heart was revealed by his lack of obedience. We see that. Good point. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments, takeaways, reflections? Let me just put it this way. Did anything jump out in this that spoke to you personally regarding where you are in your present walk? The word will do that. It's that active and that alive. Lisa. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. Right. Yep. Absolutely. That's a good point. Great takeaway. You know, Lisa was just saying how if you do things out of task, being task-oriented or just goal-oriented without the relationship with God and really seeking God while you're fulfilling his purposes, you can lose that intimacy, and then it just becomes a task, and then pride gets involved with that. And we saw that shift here when Jehu wanted to show, look what I'm doing for the Lord. He was basically bragging about his accomplishments. And that's where pride comes in. And pride always comes before a fall. Good point, Lisa. Anybody else? Joe. Yeah, he had no spiritual mentor or oversight. We don't see it here. It's not mentioned here. You know, yeah, he didn't repent. Um, Someone says here, if sin is not constantly pursued to be eradicated daily, it will seep back in slowly. Very true. That's Stephen, my son, from uh, PA. Good comment. If you don't constantly put sin to death daily, it'll seep right back in. That's why we got to examine ourselves daily. And that's why I make a comment like this. I love the cross. I run to it as much as I can. Repentance is my best friend. And there are some days my flesh is more riled up than others, and I need to repent not just once or twice, but more than that. But that's where the freedom comes from because there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. When you submit to the authority of Jesus in repentance, that's when you're restored. And you're not guilty saying, well, why do I do that again? You know why you do it again. Paul said it in chapter 7 of Romans. It's sin in you. It's the sinful nature that wants to control and dictate and dominate. So don't wrestle with your sinful nature. Acknowledge that it's wicked and repent of it and turn to God and be grateful when God forgives you of your sin because you were willing to bring it to him. That's submission to authority. So there's nothing wrong with repenting as many times as you need to. That's where the freedom comes from. The pride keeps us from repenting sometimes because we think, well, I shouldn't have to repent because I should be more spiritual than that. Your flesh is always wicked. It'll be wicked till the day you die. It's not going to change. The only thing that changes is your submission to the will of God and your submission to the Spirit of God. The quicker you repent, the quicker you're restored. And then the more you focus on the kingdom, the less you're focusing on your flesh because you're learning to kill it quickly, to put it to death fast so you're not wrestling with it. When you wrestle with your flesh, that's when fear comes, insecurity comes, that's when confusion comes, that's when we start to justify our flesh. Well, well, this is because, you know, I have this certain way about me that I see things and know things that other people don't see. Eh, wrong. Your flesh is wicked. Don't give yourself too much credit. No. Your flesh is at enmity with God. Anything outside of obedience is rebellion, and rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. Don't play with God. Submit to God. And receive his mercy and grace and love. That's what he wants to do. He wants to give us that daily. He wants us to walk in that freedom. Paul had that freedom even in prison. We need to have that freedom. 
Lewis says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of wealth springs of life, Proverbs 4.23. Very true. You got to guard your heart, what you allow in, what you listen to, what you look at, all those things. Listen, I've, I like to say things being real. There's times where I look at things that I shouldn't if I'm scrolling on my phone too much. And it's not that I'm diligently looking for something. The images on there and those things are not all good. And that affects your mind and your psyche, whether you know it or not. So if you're sitting there scrolling for hours, you're filling your head with junk. And there's repercussions to that junk. And if you're doing that and you're a person of prayer, the Holy Spirit will convict you of that. And you'll realize that and repent of it and stop doing it. Now that's the truth. Don't worry about anybody else's junk. Worry about your own junk. Search your own heart. Search your own heart. Good stuff. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments, questions, takeaways? Yes. 100%. Right. So if you have that in you to be offended easily or to judge other people based on your insecurities, that's your sin. Take that sin to God and repent of it. Don't embellish it. Don't justify it. Repent of it because that's when you'll be freed from it. Jerome, you had a question, comment? That's right. Amen. Amen. Well, being aware of that is the most important thing, that we realize when we fall into certain victim mindsets that we repent of it and then get out of it by faith, walking forward by faith and allowing God to give us the strength to move forward. And that's what we need to do. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments? Anybody else online before we... Close out in prayer tonight. You know, I want to I end with this scripture because it's, it's very familiar, but sometimes we forget it. In Philippians 4, 6 and 7, and even 8, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayers, supplications, and with thanksgiving, bring your requests before the Lord. And he will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Supernatural peace comes from taking thoughts captive and subjecting them to Christ and replacing worry, fear, and anxiety with prayer. So think about this. If you're struggling with worry, fear, and anxiety, are you praying? Are you taking those thoughts captive and giving them to God and not allowing them to fester in your mind or in your head, but you're praying through them? Then it says in verse 8, if you do that, you will know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Focus on what is good, what is admirable, what is noteworthy, what is praiseworthy. Think on these things. So our responsibility is to worry about nothing, pray about everything, be about the Lord's work. The supernatural peace of God will come to us if we're doing those things in obedience. And then focus on what is good, what is noteworthy, what is admirable, what is praiseworthy. What is good, noteworthy, praiseworthy, and admirable? The word of God. The kingdom of God, the people of God. That's where we should keep our focus. Look, dying to self is just that, dying to self. It's not about you, it's all about him. But when you die to self, God gives you a much better life. He gives you a life of purpose, passion, and destiny. He gives you intimacy and relationship. He gives you peace and joy. Those things are the blessings of the kingdom. And they're mentioned in First, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. 
Praise be to God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us all spiritual blessings in heavenly realms and in heavenly places. We don't receive spiritual blessing in the earthly realm and earthly places. Not from material things, not from temporal things, not from carnal things. We receive it from heavenly realms and heavenly places, which are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to figure your life out. Live it for God. He'll figure it out for you. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Know that. And choose to believe that and live that way. Amen? All right. Well, let's close out in prayer. Early night tonight. Got done a little early. Not a, still a lot of good content. It's not the amount of time we're here. It's the content that when we are here, and the Lord, I believe, spoke to us very clearly in and through his word tonight. So as we wrap up in prayer, I want to lift up Dave and Karen, to everyone that joins us, they're usually here worshiping. They're, they're going through some health issues right now, so we want to pray for them. Not worry about them. Pray for them. And pray for God's healing touch to be upon their bodies, their minds, their hearts, their lives. And trust God in everything. Amen? And so many other people that I'm sure you know in your family, um, in your sphere of influence, maybe you yourself, you're hurting right now. And you need healing. And it may not just be physical healing. Healing comes in many ways. There's physical healing, there's emotional healing, there's relational healing, and there's spiritual healing. Jesus is our healer. He says, by my stripes, you are healed. So in the dispensation of grace, in the covenant we have with Christ, comes healing. Now remember, we ask in faith, we believe in faith, we pray in faith, but he responds in his will, his way, his time. We have to trust him for the results. So let's do that as we wrap up tonight. Father, we just thank you. I thank you for all my brothers and sisters who have joined us tonight, those that are here, those that are online. And, Father, we pray for one another. As your word says in James 5, pray for one another. It says confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so you may be healed. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. Lord, we come before the throne of grace with a heart of thanksgiving with a heart of gratefulness, even for difficult seasons, because you promise us that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. You give us the victory in and through Christ Jesus. So we pray for the sick. We pray for Karen tonight. We pray for her healing. We pray for Dave tonight. We pray for his healing. We pray for the peace of God to be with them. And I pray for all my brothers and sisters tonight who are battling and struggling and suffering in certain areas. I pray, Lord, that your peace, your strength, your love, your endurance and perseverance would dwell with us and work in us to bring about true healing and deliverance in areas of our minds and our hearts that still need to be set free. Lord, you tell us that you're a God who heals and delivers and sets captives free. We pray for that tonight in the name of Jesus. May the Holy Spirit, who is God, do that individual and personal work in each person's life. Lord, you are the great physician. You are the great healer. And as we learn to trust you, as we learn to submit to you in our will and in our ways and walk in obedience, even when it hurts, even when we don't fully understand it, even when we don't feel it, we choose to live by faith and not by sight. Father, you promise us the right results. We know there's victory on the other side of a trial. A test becomes a testimony and a blessing for those who are called by God and a part of the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we pray for one another. We ask for divine intervention and healing in our lives, in our circumstances, in our situations. And, Lord, we choose to trust you for the results. I pray, Lord, that you would lead us to that place tonight. In Jesus' name. We pray for the nation. We pray for the leaders of our nation. We pray, God, that you would order our steps. And we know that you allow things to happen on this earth to accomplish your will in your time frame. So we pray that you would give us the strength to continue to be good witnesses, that we would fight the good fight of faith, take up the sword of the Spirit, Put on the full armor of God and be victors, never victims. Lord, continue that process of personal sanctification and also sanctification of your body 
We thank you for the church, which is called to be salt and light. I thank you for this church, MCB Church, for all the people that you've aligned here and brought here. You've called them by name personally for such a time as this. And we thank you for the new souls that have come into the kingdom over the past several weeks. We thank you, God, for adding to your church, protecting your church, and providing for your church. And we know the gates of hell shall not and will not prevail against the people of God and the church of God. And, Father, I pray these things in the mighty name, the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Join us this coming Sunday as we continue and close out the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 16. Have a blessed week, and remember, live for God. Put him first. Be with you again soon. God bless you.